Every follower of Muhammad believes sincerely that the Quran that we have today is exactly the same as the one left for them by Muhammad 1400 years ago. How true is their perception? There is absolutely no doubting the sincerity of their belief. This is, after all, exactly what their scholars have taught them throughout their life and without actually researching the subject with an open mind, they shall continue to believe it. But let us investigate the records left to us by the scholars of Muhammad and Islam themselves. At the very beginning of Islam, the Quran was being memorized and not yet compiled into a written form, especially since as long as Muhammad was alive and receiving revelations over a very long period of 23 years, new surahs were being added while others were being revised, deleted and or abrogated. Surah Al-Ankabut 29.45 Recite what is sent of the book by inspiration to thee and establish regular prayer. Surah Al-Fatir 35.31 That which we have revealed to thee of the book is the truth confirming that which was revealed before it. All verses in the Quran that speak of it as a book are wrong and deceiving, since the Quran was never in book form while Muhammad was alive. When Muhammad died, there existed no singular codex of the Quranic text. That is, there was not in existence any collection of revelations in a final review form. Also, there was not a single memorizer who knew all the verses of the Quran. All these verses were scattered in the memories of hundreds of Huffad memorizers. Without a doubt, Muhammad failed utterly in his primary mission of giving his followers a single authorized scripture because in reality he died without authenticating a unified codex of the Qur'an. The fact that he left his followers with seven modes or versions of the Qur'an speaks volumes about his failure. The consequences of this failure became a paramount when his followers were reciting different versions of the alleged words of Allah. This failure has endured and continues for the last 1400 years. All attempts by his present followers to gloss over this fact are doomed to fail, since the records of the Muhammadan scholars in the centuries after his death attest to otherwise. After his death, and as the memorizers, Huffad, were becoming extinct through slaughter in battle or otherwise, Umar ibn al-Khattab recommended that it should be committed to writing. Abu Bakr entrusted this task to Zayd ibn Thabit of al-Madina, who used to be Muhammad's secretary. Sahih al-Bukhari hadith 6.509 narrated by Zayd bin Thabit. Abu Bakr al-Sadiq sent for me when the people of the Yamama had been killed, i.e. a number of the Prophet's companions who fought against Musaylima. I went to him and found Umar ibn al-Khattab sitting with him. Abu Bakr then said to me, Umar has come to me and said, casualties were so heavy among the Qurra of the Qur'an, i.e. those who knew the Qur'an by heart on the day of the battle of Yamama and I'm afraid that more heavy casualties may take place among the Qur'an on other battlefields, whereby a large part of the Qur'an may be lost. Therefore, I suggest you, Abu Bakr, order that the Qur'an be collected. So I started looking for the Qur'an and collected it from what was written on palmed stalks, thin white stones, and also from the men who knew it by heart till I found the last verse of Surah At-Tawbah, Repentance, with Abi Khuzayma al-Ansari, and I did not find it with anybody other than him. All were brought together and the text was constructed. From the above quotes, it means that the pagan Arabs had not by then mastered the art of writing or the use of writing materials, such as clay, papyrus, metal sheets, or even skins of animals. The Arabs of the Hijaz, contrary to all the efforts of Muhammadan propaganda, were mostly illiterate and uneducated people. Then the complete manuscripts of the Qur'an remained with Abu Bakr till he died, then with Umar till the end of his life, and then with Hafsa, the daughter of Umar. In 651 AD, Uthman bin Affan canonized the Medina Codex and ordered all others, six other versions of the Qur'an, destroyed. If it were true that there were many memorizers of the Qur'an, why then did they need to collect the Qur'anic verses from the diverse and unrelated documents such as leaf stalk, bone, parchments, as well as the memories of men? What is also blatantly problematic to the Muhammadan scholars are the variations in the several extant Qur'ans of the time 
making it impossible to tell which version is the alleged word of Allah, since his word should have been only one and not several. In fact, there were several metropolitan codices in Arabia, Syria and Iraq with divergent readings, blamed on the defective nature of the Kuf Kufic script, which contained no vowels. And so the consonants of verbs could be read as actives or passives, and worse still, many of the consonants themselves could not be distinguished without diacritical dots which were added much later. Sahih al-Bukhari hadith 6.510 narrated by Anas bin Malik addresses this subject perfectly. A further serious impediment which complicated the correct compilation of the Quran is the fact that there were verses which were spoken in Medina but were included in surahs which began in Mecca and vice versa. The problem that existed and persisted during the lifetime of Muhammad for his followers is the fact that for as long as he was alive, new revelations whereby the omniscient Allah was nonetheless allegedly changing his mind were very conveniently being added to and some subtracted from earlier ones, abrogated and abrogating verses which affected 71 of the 114 surahs of the Quran. This is why at the time of Muhammad's death, there existed no singular codex of the sacred text. It is also reported that some major parts of a surah were eaten by a domestic animal. Another surah, that of a rajm was asserted by Umar ibn al-Khattab to have existed but is not included in the Quran. The final text of the Quran was actually fixed in the year 933 AD. Since the Quran is supposed to be the word of Allah, who is the one who taught Moses the Torah, then the only and unmistakable conclusion for the erroneous inconsistencies and differences between them must be because it was the Muhammadans who corrupted the Quran to suit their own agenda. The criminal invariably projects upon his victim his own hatreds, shortcomings and lack of morality and justice. So do the Arabs and the Muhammadan scholars. They have conspired over the centuries and even at the present to control all the information that they passed on to the believers by perpetuating the myths of the perfect and divine Quran contrary to the historical, philological and theological records that prove it to be otherwise. In fact, the greatest threat to Muhammadan Islam is the acquisition of knowledge, especially of the Bible, by the masses of believers. Of 114 surahs in the Quran, only 43 were not changed. All the others had verses that were either abrogated or abrogating. This means that in the course of 23 years of Muhammad's mission, the omniscient Allah changed his mind at least 71 times. In summation, the following historical and theological facts are crystal clear and indisputable. 1. The greatest number of traditions and fetishes of the Muslims are nothing but a continuance and repackaging and Islamization of pagan rites and actions that pre-existed Muhammad and his Quran. 2. Almost all the precepts and concepts of importance in the Quran have been plagiarized, plundered, pirated and or perverted from the Hebrew Bible as scriptures, from the New Testament and Apocrypha, from pagan Arabian religion and also from Zoroastrian religion and traditions. Abu al-Fatih Muhammad Shahristani, in his valuable book on sex and religions, Al-Milal Wal-Nihal, asserts that many of the rights and duties of Islam are continuations and practices which the pagan Arabs had adopted from the Jews. 3. Even if Muhammad were illiterate, not able to read or write, does not negate his ability to compose and recite prose and or poetry. Most of the poets of Arabia were illiterate but masters of the spoken language. The oral poetic tradition of the Arabs was their greatest legacy since they left almost nothing in the form of writing, thus proving beyond a shadow of a doubt that poetry and prose in Arabia was completely independent from literacy. The followers of Muhammad can try their best to obfuscate, contort, pervert and twist the facts to prove otherwise, but it is a mission impossible to accomplish. That is why, when they cannot counter the truth with facts or logic, they invariably resort to violence to silence their opponents, just as was done earlier by Muhammad. 